He's coming as the captain of the host. Mm. And that means he's coming as the boss. And the Lord does, says he doesn't reveal anything unless he does it to his, shows his prophets first. And the thing is, the Lord prophetically has been speaking time and time again. Make yourself ready. Position yourself for I'm coming as the king of glory. Make way. You know, like John the Baptist, make way in the wilderness. And there's a, there's a, a crooked place being made straight. There's a rough place being made smooth. There's a mountain being leveled and valleys being raised. This is the positioning of the Lord. And, and through the week, I had this dream. It was sort of like all night. And I felt like the Lord was saying, you know, position, position, come into position. I'm coming as the captain. I'm coming as the commander. I'm coming as the Lord of hosts. And I'm like, oh, wow, Lord, what does that mean? What do you mean being positioned? Like, I, I already know, but I'm funny in dreams. I always ask questions. And then when I was waking up, I didn't hear really, you know, it was almost like, oh, well, you, you got to know how to flow with the captain. That was what I was feeling. And then this is what the Lord said to me through the day when I was praying in the spirit. I'm like, Lord, I was trying to unlock this dream. Oh, here we go. Here's the anointing. Oh. Ha, ha. He said, oh, it's a time for my people to learn how to say, yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's the position. Yes, sir. Oh, can you feel an anointing on that? Ha! Oh, there's such an anointing on that. Receive the yes, sir, anointing. Sorry, Al. Oh, I like to get up close and personal. None of this stage preaching. Sorry, it's a trumpet. It's announcing the coming of the Lord. And I'm not talking about the second coming. I'm, quite, I'm talking about the Lord coming to his church because he's going to move through his church. He's going to demonstrate himself through his people. But there's a positioning. And I've been harping on like a crack record about humility, about the low place, about, you know, being low enough to be able to carry the weight. Because you have to be a position to be able to carry the weight of his coming. Because the glory is kavod, it is weight, it is heavy. And when God fulfills in your life what he said he's going to fulfill, it's going to carry a weight. It's going to carry the demonstration of himself. And he wants to show himself strong on your behalf. He wants to demonstrate himself through your life. But there's a being made perfect, not perfect in like doing everything right, positioned. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But I thought, well, Lord, what do you mean that his pe your people have got to be? It was, I, this is how I heard it. Positioned, my people have got to learn how to say yes, sir. The Lord's had me in Chronicles this week. And uh, I really felt to read about David. And this week the Lord said, not, not in Samuel, Anita, I want you to be in Chronicles. So I've been in Chronicles, First Chronicles. Oh, thank you, Lord. Sorry, the anointing's very strong. Ha! Oh! Anyway, the Lord was showing me about this yes sir business and he said, Anita, he, you know, he's got an issue with man taking strength, man taking uh, glory in their own strength. And he began to, because I thought, why am I in Chronicles? You know, I know the story of David, blah, blah, but there was a few things, a few instances that really stood out to me. And one of them was when David counted the men. You know, you look and David was raised to kingship. He was anointed by God and God was so for him. And the Lord was behind him. He backed him. I mean, it says in Chronicles that the amount, like he just went up, like war after war after war, battle after battle, enemy after, and just defeated. Bang, 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 just defeated. He just, any battle David went to just whoosh, was done. God was just with him. And Satan didn't like that. He's like, man, how, see, how can you stop someone who God is for? If God is for you, no one can be against you. But God will try, uh, the devil will try. The only way that you can, I guess, hinder that, or that can be hindered, is through your choices. And so I was just really, I read this passage in... First Chronicles, I think it's 21. Let's just, if you want to go there, you can. Otherwise, I'm going to read it. 
It talks about, the First Chronicles 20 talks about all the wars, all this, you know, he went up against this, he went up against these people, and you know, they're all getting defeated. And then next chapter, First Chronicles 21, Satan himself come to David. I, I just didn't see it like this before. I forgot. I hadn't read that scripture in a long time. I'm like, man, he must have been causing some damage. See, God, and, and I, so I don't have to preach the whole sermon, I'm on the Davidic, God is restoring the, the, the Judah ruler, kingship, thy will be done, thy kingdom come. His kingdom is coming. And that same throne that God was with David, he's going to be with his people. Because they're going to rule through the line of the tribe of Judah, who is from the root of Jesse, which is David. David God said in Amos 9.11, he will raise up the tabernacle of David. In that day, we are in that day. Saul's house is coming down. Man's works, man's efforts, the praises of man, the showmanship of man that has hindered the demonstration of the kingdom coming, is coming down. And so the Davidic house is being restored. Those that have a heart after God, those that are, that are going to do it God's way. And I... I, I saw this post this week on Facebook from a friend, Jody Hughes, and she wrote, "People will abort the, uh, many people abort the, the, the mission or the destiny of God, not because they don't believe the promise, but because they don't like the process. And so many, um, you know, there was a, a few people that commented and said, you know, I don't know if I agree with that. That sounds works, pro you know, that sounds works orientated. I know, just, you know, people have different ways of looking at it. And I couldn't help but comment because I thought, no, this is very true. And I said, if you've ever walked with God, you're going to understand that he's going to take you through the valley of the shadow of death. He's going to take you in a place of death to yourself and purification if you want to walk close with him. And I said, I, I, I felt like the Lord, you know, the Lord is Will take if he will take you if you don't understand that you've never been in a Gethsemane experience because Jesus actually didn't like the process, Jesus himself didn't like the way in which God took him in order to fulfill destiny. And God was restoring the Davidic kingdom through Jesus himself. So, if Jesus is the example, then how much more for us? He said. You, you know, the student's not greater than the teacher. For what I go through, that is what you will follow. I am the shepherd, you know. I lead you. And so in Gethsemane, Jesus said, you know, look, can we do this another way? Let's have a conversation about this whole your will and your way thing. I want your will. And some of you here have heard me say this before, but I feel like a few ears need to hear it. The Lord, he says, you know, Lord... I want the will. I want the end result. See, we sometimes get revealed the end result. I want that will. I want the, the promise fulfilled. Jesus saw the joy set before him. He knew what was on the other side. He knew it was mankind reconciled to the Father. He knew the keys were going to get taken off the enemy. He knew order was going to be restored to the kingdom of this earth and the heavens. He understood that, but he said, can we, like for a moment, can we just do this another way? Can this cup pass before me? Not thy will, but my, yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. And so the cup is the way of God. He's saying, like, can we, I don't want to do it your way, but can we do it another way? And see, the thing is, this is the positioning of the yes, sir. There is a remnant. There is a remnant. And, and there is a people that will say, yes, sir. There is a people that are, that are called and set apart to be able to function in true governmental authority. And to function in true governmental authority of the kingdom of heaven, there has to be an understanding of submission to authority. And I'm not just talking natural, like, you know, natural authority. I'm talking, yes, sir, to God. You know, I was thinking about this today even as I was just preparing my heart and you know just a little incidents with our kids you know there, there's a there is a training we have to do with our kids in obedience 
And today, you know, uh, Sasha said to one of the kids, um, you're going to come with me to church, like Tuesday, like, because we come separate, so there's like, who's, what, which kids are going to come with who, right? And there's always a banter every week. Who's going with who? So, so <laughs> there are certain ones we like to separate, because they can, you know, the enemy can use them, let's say that, in the moments before church. So we like to, you know, take out those uh, variables and separate them so that we come to church in peace. Put it that way. So it was one of these moments where we were choosing which, and Sasha just decided this one and this one are coming with me. Anyway, but we had a resistance. There was a, there was a, a resistance. <laughs> No, I don't want to go with you. Well, you're coming with me. But why? And this is where... And, and Sasha said, because you're coming with me. But why? Because you're coming with me. And I was, I was listening to this because I was, I was not in the same room. I was listening to this conversation. I'm like, yes, Lord, there is a training in obedience to say yes, sir, regardless of why, regardless of needing to understand the cause and effect. But it's a yes to the Father's voice. And so if God, if we, if we are to train our kids in obedience, like the Lord was saying, this Anita is how I train my people to respond to my voice, regardless of whether they get it, regardless of whether it's convenient. You know, because one of the children was saying, but I'm not, I'm not ready. I'm not organised. I haven't got all my things together. I, no, no, you, you excuse after excuse, and sometimes we can make excuses. No, well, you know, I'm not organised. I'm not ready. No, because all my ducks haven't lined up this and that, I was thinking I'd go this way in order to fulfil your destiny. I don't like this other way because it looks messy and chaotic. Because sometimes God's way doesn't look very ordered. You think you're going like no man's land. I don't know if any of you have experienced that before. Like, am I talking to the right people? Ha! <laughs> But the Lord does that to empty us of ourselves, so that we can submit to, we can be under his authority and understand his authority. Because when Captain says, go this way, we'll move and we won't take other people out. See, even Wayne can attest to this. In, a, in battle and in an army, you've got to listen to your captain. You don't have time on the battlefield to say, uh, why? <laughs> Do you? And if you do, you could put all your other mates at risk. See, your obedience actually has a direct result on other people. Whether you like it, lump it, or want to leave it, it does. You don't have a choice of whether that is the way it is. You, whether you say yes or no to God is going to affect people. And so God is bringing a people that are going to be able to flow in this governmental place that are going to understand, yes, sir. You know, it's even like, um, and I've shared this with the students before, but Rick Joyner, because he, um, he was trained as a military man, and he was saying that, you know, like, uh, the discipline of God is like the, uh, what's that guy in the boot camp? What's he called? Sergeant Major. Yeah, yeah, the sergeant in boot camp, you know, when he's like dr the drill sergeant, you know, like he's, and the thing is, he's one of the most hated officers in the army, the drill sergeant, because he just like deals with them all, you know, he's rah, 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 at them, right? And Rick Joyner was saying this, and I thought it was just so, um, you know, in, like a great analogy. He said the drill sergeant is the most hated, but when they're on the battlefield, he's the most loved. Because all that training of learning how to say yes, sir, comes into being. It's called discipline. Not discipline like we understand of punishment. Discipline's not punishment. Punishment is punishment. Discipline is boundaries. That's what discipline is. And so God prepares us for authority through boundaries. Just like David. David was anointed king, but he wasn't given his rightful rule. Then he had to go through a season of discipline of testing, of faithfulness, of seeing whether he could handle this place of kingship. And now we get to this place in 1 Chronicles 21 where now 
He's at a point of such great victory. And this can be where we're vulnerable. And this is where, you know, even Sasha said a couple of weeks ago, I feel like I need to prepare you for revival. Well, that was that's that term. I feel like that's what we've been doing. We're preparing you to flow with the king. To flow with what's going to happen because he's about to step in. And every, I just keep seeing this vision before me of the king coming with his feet, it, like the dominion. Feet to me represent authority and dominion. And the Lord's about to step in sovereignly. And his people need to know how to flow with him. Because it's so vital he won't share his glory with another. And, and so this is a great example here where now he's at a great place of victory. He hasn't lost a battle. And that's where, you know, the Lord even gave the Israelites before they went into the promised land. I've been reading this for months. Deuteronomy, uh, Exodus and Numbers. He's given them all promises and actual, not just promises, he's actually giving them instruction. These were the instructions. Don't forsake the Lord your God when you go into the land and be blessed with all the blessings. I say that I'm going to bless you. Because when the glory comes, when he moves on your behalf, you will be blessed as well as others. And the Lord is preparing us not to forget him because we think, oh, we won't forget him. It's easy in good times to loosen, and get slack and forget. It is. And God, I believe, is warning his people in, in, in training them to say yes, sir, because Satan himself stood up against Israel and stirred up David to number Israel. Satan, I just thought, I've forgotten that. I just thought, oh, David just did it one day because like he got like full of himself. No, we've got to understand there's a very real enemy. And what does he want to do? He wants to steal your victory. He wants to, to cause you to stumble. And the vulnerable place is when you're in success. That's when you're most vulnerable, is when you've got victory and you've done it. And Joab, his officer, was a bit perplexed. You know, David said to Joab and the rulers of the people, go number Israel from Bathsheba to Dan and bring me the total that I may know it. And Joab answered, may the Lord multiply his people a hundred times. But my Lord, the king, are they not all the, the, my Lord's servants? Why then does my Lord require this? Why will he bring guilt upon Israel? Joab knew instantly, you don't do that. You don't, you don't, we're sinning here. Because Joab knew the motive from which it was coming from. But the king's word prevailed against Joab. So Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. Joab gave the total number of people to David and all of Israel were 1,100,000 who drew the sword, and of Judah, 470,000 who drew the sword. But Levi and Benjamin, he did not include among them, for the king's order was detestable to Joab. So Joab only did even partly obey the king. Like that, I love, I love details in scripture, because you really see stuff. Joab couldn't even go to Benjamin, and Levi, was it? Because he's like, I can't even believe this. So he brought back the number and God was displeased with this in the Amplified. You've got to read it in the Amplified. In brackets, reliance on human resources. And he smote Israel. So what was the reason why God was annoyed with David? Because David left the reliance of God and went back and it showed that he was reliant on the natural realm. That actually upsets God a bit. It does. Because God was taking me to Gideon as well. God was talking to me about Gideon. And I was, he always speaks to me in the bathroom. I'm either brushing my teeth, doing my hair, doing something in there. Maybe my mind's blank for once. Oh, no. Oh. Yesterday, brushing my teeth. And I'm like, you know, brushing my teeth over the sink, bent over, and I'm hearing this. I'm raising up Gideons, you know. <laughs> I'm like, oh, thanks, God. That's great. Huh? I love it when he speaks like that because then I know it's him because I'm not thinking about anything, you know. So I'm looking, so I go, and, you know, okay, Lord, I know the Gideon story very well, so what are you trying to say? 
You know, obviously, you, look, when God speaks to you one-liners, you don't ever just say, okay. That means you need to ask me questions now. <laughs> That's what it means. I'm telling you something. Now, fish, go on a search, go on a treasure hunt. Don't you just sit on that. You need to come to me now and ask me questions. So because I know, I know Gideon's story by the back of my hand, I'm like, but I know I'm not dumb enough to know if God's saying that. I need to go to him. Okay, God, what are you saying? So how do I go to him? I read, I read the whole passage again because there's something in there he's wanting to highlight. And this was the piece, and I know this piece, but this is what the neon sign landed on. So when I was reading Gideon, so God comes to Gideon and says, right, I'm going to raise you up to deliver Israel, blah, blah. All this, we know the story. He gathers an army. He set the... He, pulls down the altars first. Interesting. Interesting. He pulls down the altars first before they can get victory. The Lord is tearing down altars in this hour where his church had been worshipping around false altars. So the church can get victory. We wonder why we're not walking in full victory because there's mixture. There's mixture. We're being seduced by Jezebel's teachings, just saying. Anyway, Let's keep going. Oh. So anyway, it's the truth. So, and then God says to Gideon, all right, so they've got to go up against the Moabites of, you know, they've all camped. They're in this, or the Midianites, I think they're, sorry, Midianites. They're camped all in the valley. And God says, oh, before you go, I just have to say something to you. you got too many. you got too many. How can you ever have too many? The Lord said, you got too many. Because actually, why is you going to think you did this victory? So he said, so he actually sent like, how many thousand home? I don't know, a, a lot of, a lot of thousands home. And then he was left with a portion and then, you know the story, it was divided and divided and however many are fearful, leave, go home. And now he's left with 300. Because the Lord wasn't going to take this battle with the, with the sword. He was going to take it by the Spirit, by the move of God, by the move of God's hand. Because why? So God can get the victory and the glory. And so this is the place that we are at where God said, I'm raising up Gideons. Gideons say, yes, sir. Gideons will go the unconventional way. They won that battle, if you remember, very unconventionally. Go get a clay pot with a torch and a trumpet. Uh, go in at night and just blow it and smash it. No swords allowed, by the way. And that was, do you know why it says in scripture, they, weren't, they had those two in their hands so they couldn't take a sword. But they shouted the sword of Gideon. But Gideon didn't have a sword. So how could they shout the sword of Gideon? It was the word of the Lord. They went into battle with the word of the Lord. And that is the sword that you will get victory in. And this is that hour where God is calling a remnant. Because there was a remnant in Gideon's army that understood the unconventional way and didn't want to lean on their own understanding and were actually fearless because he said all the fearful ones had to go. And then all the ones that were consumed in themselves, they had to go too. Because there was a, a test down at the river where they had to, you know, drink water and however they drank the water revealed who was going to be brave enough to do it. Like, come on. So there were some that kneeled down and the story goes, I've heard this story, I have to research the truth of it, but the story goes that they knelt down and they had their hand to their sword so they were in, prep, they were in position of alertness and the other hand they were drinking and lapping. But the others, they just got on all fours and stuck their head in the water and didn't care. Well, that to me speaks, now you can take this or leave it, but to me that speaks of self like being self-consumed. Oh, here we go. I'll just fill my belly. God's like, no, you'll be a, you'll be a uh, problem. <laughs> <gasps> Why? Why will that be a problem? Because they won't have the courage to go on the word of the Lord. 
Because you need courage, man, to go on the word of the Lord. Because it's none of you. God will strip you back. You say, that's not God. Yes, it is. He will strip you back. He'll strip you back. you got all these gifts and talents and strength. No, no, sorry. He's going to strip you back. It's called pruning. He'll strip you back to learn the reliance of God and to learn the yes, sir, of God. Ha! Because in the yes, sir, comes the victory. And that same with Joshua. Joshua took 40 years to learn the yes, sir, of God. The angel of the Lord come to him. He said, who are you for me or against me? He said, neither. Well, that's interesting. Would be nice if you were for me. Just no, I'm here to deliver the instruction. What did Joshua do? Yes, sir. Okay, we're gonna run around the. We'll just wait a minute. I'll just wait. I've got to get the courage to go back and tell them all how we're gonna get this victory. Yeah, we're gonna run around the city seven days, once a day. Now I know why Moses said to me before we crossed the river. Be a stronger courage, don't fear. And then God came to me three times in one sentence and said the same thing. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear, for the Lord is with you wherever you go. I'm, I'm like, he didn't take a breath. God didn't take a breath. If you read Joshua chapter 1, God didn't take a breath. He just kept saying, I said to you, be, like there was no conversation. This was a monologue. This was not a dialogue. God said three times, I told you, be of good courage. And Joshua was like, man, I didn't even respond. Why are, you, why are you saying that? Do you remember that? Because it looks like Joshua's back chatting him. But there was no mock dialogue. I said, be of good courage. For the Lord, blah, blah, blah. Next verse. I said, be of good courage. I told you, be of good courage. And now Joshua's received the instruction of God. He says, now I get it. I get it. I get it. Because do you know what? Joshua's a good warrior. So he's like, we can go in. We can take this land. Because Joshua was one of the spies at the beginning who said, yep, no problem. God's with us. Let's go in with our swords. And they did eventually do natural battles. But God said, not the first one, you're not. Nope. And the same with Gideon. He said, not with the sword, only the word. The sword of the Lord is what's going to win this victory. So I say to you today, therefore, brethren, the Lord doesn't want us to be have any play. You might say, I don't understand this process, God. I don't get this process. I don't like this process. But God is saying in the process is positioning you to say yes, sir. In the process, you are actually, if you say yes to God, God is positioning you for governmental authority. You're not just a pew warmer. You're someone to walk in the government of God and the government of heaven. We're all, that's the price Jesus paid. Hello? Seated with him in heavenly places? Well, what does he do up there? He rules and reigns. And he wants us, he wants to give us that same. He said, all authority and power I've given you. You can tread on any serpent or scorpion. Well, you know, when's the last time you tread on a scorpion and it didn't and, and it didn't hurt you? No, I'm being serious. God wants us, he's like shaking his church. Wake up! Wake up! to walking in the supernatural. Come on. The natural's not enough. It's not representing me very well. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's not represent. I want to be represented well on this earth. And sons that know their father will represent as the son knew the father. But those who know religion can't represent the father because they don't know him. And God's bringing us to know him as the father. And if we know him as the father, we've learned obedience just like our kids. We've learned discipline. We've learned the boundaries of God. And he, and he puts boundaries on us to cause us to come into maturity. Go read Romans 12. That's your homework. Not Romans, Hebrews 12, chapter 1. Hebrews 12? Hebrews 12, verse 1 and through. Because it talks about the disciplining of the Lord. But then it says, and those who yield to it, so those who are trained by it, those who say yes, even though it's like a death to self and we want our own agendas, it says we'll reap a fruitful harvest of righteousness in their life. What is righteousness? They do it God's way. So the boundaries are to teach us to do it God's way. Yeah. And if we do it God's way, then we have victory. And who wants victory? I do. Because captain's coming. And when he starts throwing out some orders, 
there ain't time to say no because your obedience will affect other people. Your disobedience could delay someone else's breakthrough. You might be walking down the street and there's a wheelchair and God says, touch him, and you go, nah, I'm fearful. I'm one of the fearful ones of Gideon. I don't want to touch them. Well, you've just delayed their breakthrough. This is the type of stuff we're moving into. It's none of this showmanship stuff. I'm talking about kingdom coming in your life, in your workplace, in your school, in your, in your sphere of influence. Come on. No excuses anymore. It's not up to it, this, this religiosity that, that, that has stunted the church's growth of maturity and why the sons of God aren't manifested. is because truly religion has been holding the reins. Saul's house has been in government. And God says, oh, sorry, there's a change of government. There's a shift of government happening because now it's time for sons to be manifest. Don't you love it? And religion will say only the, oh, the preachers, it's their job. Well, that's just a load of baloney because the word of the Lord says that preachers are there to equip the saints for them to go do it. Hello? Not to be pew warmers, making excuses week in, week out. Dead set. It's time for grow up in the church and it's time for us to come into maturity. Hey Amen. I'm preaching on a sermon. All right. Better stop. Ha! Crash to Cambrain. Just can I say one last thing? Is that okay? I just felt like the Lord said, and just tell them this. This is what I just heard the Lord say. Don't forget this. It's not going to look like what you think. It's going to look different to what you think. But in the process of learning the ways of God, even though you might be uncomfortable with how he moves, the knowing of him in the secret place, you're going to recognise it's his hand. Mm 